But if my troubleshooting this morning worked, we're recording video now. Um, so uh, just a couple quick things I want to say about this. Um, uh, and you know, of course, I'm moving into those slides, which are posted for today. Um, I also didn't mention briefly to you guys last time kind of whose immune system we're talking about um, throughout this semester and throughout this course. Um, so I mentioned to you at the end last time that um, immunology or the immune system is sort of our defense against infection, defense against different microbes. And you might spend a second where you think, well, okay, great. What organisms can be infected by microbes? Because if an organism can be infected, it probably needs to have an immune system. Um, and if you actually ask that question of what organisms can be infected by microbes, the answer is yes. Um, because there are, because every organism actually has this threat um, of infection. So um, animals are infected, plants are infected, um, actually bacteria are infected by viruses. Um, there are actually viruses that are infected by other viruses. So the idea of a defense system is broad across all types of organisms. For the vast majority of the time in this class, we are going to be basically talking about the immune system that's found in these blue groups of organisms, um, which are um, jawed vertebrates. So we're really talking about the vertebrate immune system here. Um, there are a few places um, where I will mention things about organisms outside the vertebrates. And there certainly are defense systems outside the vertebrates. But we are really talking about um, kind of the classic vertebrate immune system here. Um, and that's not that the other ones aren't cool. They're fascinating. So for example, plant immunology, fascinating. Bacterial immunology, fascinating. Invertebrate immunology, fascinating. Um, but just in terms of time and focus for the course, it's not something that we're able to really get super into right now. So by and large, we're talking about um, the, the, the jawed vertebrates, um, which starts with a type of fish called lampreys. Um, and uh, the immune systems that we see there. Um, and again, I'll men there will be a few places where I'm going to mention um, a couple things about some of the broader defense systems, but really we're thinking about vertebrates here. Um, before we can think about um, those vertebrates and their immune systems, um, I've got a couple sort of big picture reminders to give you. Um, and these are three different quotes that sort of get at um, why I am telling you this. Um, and you can note that all of these talk about the concept of knowing something about the thing you are fighting against, um, whether you want to go to the act of war with Sun Tzu or whether you want to go with uh, Green Day. Um, they all talk about this idea. And so we should make sure um, that we are just clear about a couple of things about uh, pathogens. I'm not going to go into tons and tons of info about them because that's a whole other class. Um, but I want to just make sure that we're on the same page about a few pieces of their uh, biology. So first of all, and there is a, this is, this one is really, really important. In fact, Part of me feels bad about making this only one slide right now. Um, you are going to hear more and more and more about this over the course of the semester. Um, I would say that when I have talked to non-scientists and when I've talked to the press throughout this pandemic, this point has been one of those points that I make honestly in every single interview I do. This is one of those points that I feel like if the, everyone in the world knew this, <laughs> life would be a little bit better, um, which is that the, t the word infection and the word disease mean different things. And so infection and disease are not the same. Um, so infection is a state 
where a microorganism is established and growing within a host. So infection means that you have a microbe in you growing. It does not mean, I mean, really, it just means you got a microbe in you. It has nothing to do with whether or not you're sick and whether or not you're harmed, whether or not you even know you have that microbe. If that microbe is in you, you're infected. Um, disease is some kind of damage or injury to the host that impairs host function. Um, sometimes people define disease as um, getting out of homeostasis. Um, there are diseases that have nothing to do with infection. Like you could imagine, say, Alzheimer's disease or diabetes or sickle cell anemia. Those are diseases that have nothing to do with infection. There are also times when you are infected with a microbe, but you do not have disease. So just because you're in contact with a microbe doesn't mean you're going to get infected. The micro infection actually means the microbe kind of has to establish in you. And just because you're infected, it does not mean you're going to have disease. In fact, in order to get to disease, there are a whole lot of steps that have to happen following your exposure to a microbe. Um, so just, again, to kind of give you a couple of examples of this, the mo one of the more salient examples is that we have learned during this pandemic that SARS-CoV-2 is able to lead to infections where you do not have symptoms. So it leads to infection, but not disease. That's why even if we feel fine, we wear a mask. <laughs> I also mentioned last time that you have a whole bunch of um, bacteria in your GI tract that are helping you with digestion, that are making enzymes, all that good stuff. You are infected with all of those things. That is a those are all officially infections. And so infection doesn't necessarily mean anything bad. You shouldn't necessarily think of infections as always being terrible. If an infection leads to disease, in the case of an infectious disease, that's a problem, but it's not 100% always something that has to happen. And so as we're thinking about how we defend here, we can think about are some of our defenses protecting us from infection or are they protecting us from disease? Um, and that's a big deal um, with the immune system. Um, if we think about all of the microorganisms in the world, um, it is probably estimated that maybe 1%, if that, can cause disease. Um, so not all microbes are pathogens. Most of the ones I think about are because that's what I do. Um, but there are plenty that are not. Um, and so a pathogen is a microorganism that causes disease. Um, the process of, that disease, of causing that disease is pathogenesis. And the reason why it's important to bring this up right now is that in general, when microbes cause disease, so when microbes mess with your homeostasis, there are two potential things going on. It might be that the microbe is hurting you. It might be that the microbe does something to mess with your body. Alternatively, it may be actually your response that is giving you the signs and symptoms that you feel. And so the process of having disease following infection has some part of it that's coming from the effect of the microbe on you, but also has some part of it that actually is how your body has changed in order to fight that microbe. So there are some parts of what people think about as disease caused by microbes or as infectious disease that are actually your immune system doing its job and trying to kill the microbe and are not the, something that the microbe did to you. 
And so as we are learning about the immune system and just learning the general functions, in some cases we're actually learning about how diseases happen too. Because sometimes those correct, good physiologic responses are going to cause problems. And so some of the diseases we see following microbial infection are actually linked to the immune response, um, actually leading to those issues. Um, so that's something that we need to be aware of throughout this entire semester as we see many of these types of responses. Uh, all right, so um, your textbook talks about um, four different kinds of possible pathogens. Those four path types of pathogens are shown here. Um, these are, you know, types of pathogens you've probably heard about in Bio-150, Bio-160. Um, and they include viruses, bacteria, uh, fungi, and parasites. And there are some examples of those here. Um, those, I these examples from the textbook and the way that they're, we've got some information written about them to their right also highlights another important feature or another important aspect of thinking about infection and disease that I do want to mention really briefly um, because it's something that you want to pay close attention to. It's all tied to what I've just been talking about. So you guys are all familiar with a disease known as lung cancer. Yes, you've heard of lung cancer? Okay. What is a famous way one gets lung cancer? Justin. Smoking. So you know what smoking is. You know what lung cancer is, right? You also know that they're not the same thing. Smoking causes lung cancer. Lung cancer is what happens to your body. Smoking is the thing that messes with your body to make cancer happen. If I said, oh, that guy just went outside to have a lung cancer, you would laugh at me, as you just did, and say I sound ridiculous. You know that you can't use the word smoking and lung cancer interchangeably. One of them is a cause, one of them is an effect. Similarly, we have to be careful when we're thinking about the names of infections and the names of diseases. Some infections cause a disease. Oftentimes, people slip up and they use those two words interchangeably and they, they use the wrong ones. They use one when they mean the other. And so we want to be careful with that because part of that disease that's happening as a result of that infection might not even be the microbe's fault. <laughs> It might be part of the host's fault. And so we have to sort of differentiate between the name of the microbe and the name of the disease. And so just to give you sort of two examples HIV is the name of a virus, so it's a microbe. AIDS is the name of the disease that happens when someone is infected with this virus. Um, and so you can spread HIV from person to person. You don't spread AIDS from person to person. <laughs> um, and so we want to be careful of that. So your body responds to HIV, and part of that response might give you this disease of AIDS. Similarly, The virus SARS-CoV-2 leads to this disease called COVID-19. So we are wearing a mask to prevent us from spreading SARS-CoV-2 because if we spread it to someone, they can get COVID-19. Um, and in fact, both cases here, as well as any other case or example I could give you, um, there's some effect of the microbe and there's some effect of the host going on. And so that's why we want to differentiate between the name of the microbe and the name of the disease. Um, can't think of a, I don't know if there's a single interview I 
did with a single journalist where I haven't had to explain that one to. Um, so that's that info. Um, but here are our major types of pathogens. Um, and here, in fact, we have the name of the microbes with the name of the disease that is caused by that microbe in this table. Um, so when we think about these microbes, there are a few pieces of information that we want to think about with them. Um, so one of those things that we want to think about is how quickly those microbes replicate, how quickly they reproduce. So imagine if you are going to design a defense system against some enemy, these might be some things you need to know about that enemy if you're going to defend yourself. And one of them is, how quickly can you get more of the enemy? So let's think about this for a second. Um, some of you guys have taken micro. What is the typical time, the typical generation time for, say, like E. coli when it has lots of nutrients? What's the, how long does it take to go from one bacteria, like E. coli, to two? A little bit longer, but you're but you're 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 getting there in terms of the time frame. Yeah. So a little bit longer, a little shorter. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Twenty minutes. <laughs> um, so usually we think about bacteria reproducing, going from one cell to two cells in about twenty minutes. Okay, fine. How long does it take? In a past year, Dr. Dunaway started this class, and I asked this question in class that year, and no one knew the answer, and he was appalled, just appalled. So happily, Dr. Dunaway is not here today. Um, how long does it take for one of your cells to go from one cell to two? And in fact, the number I usually use here is actually kind of like fast as possible. So the answer here is that, in fact, the fastest your cell could divide, the fastest you can go from one of your cells to two of your cells is 24 hours. So if I put one of your cells and an E. coli cell here and wanted them to like battle against each other, in the time where you could go from one human cell to two human cells, the E. coli would have gone through, so it's three generations in an hour, and 24 hours, that's 72 generations. Um, so in fact, you would have two to the 72 power of the E. coli um, versus one, or there's now two human cells. Um, so this numbers problem is a big problem when you think about defense. And just simply making sure that microbes can't reproduce as fast as they'd want to is pretty important in terms of being able to stop them. I say that for bacteria. Viruses, in many cases, can reproduce even faster. So a virus will infect a cell. When that cell bursts more viruses, it might burst a million. And so that might happen in, a, in some number of hours, but at the same time, it's getting up to a million at the end after one. So just knocking down numbers. <laughs> ends up being really important in some of these immune responses. We also want to think about, are the pathogens in some way different than our cells? Do they offer any targets that are unique? If we want to actually respond to a microbe without hurting our cells, we probably have to know what's different between the microbial cells and our cells. If we think about the different classes of pathogens. One of them is a lot more different than our cells than others in terms of offering lots of unique targets. 
Which one might be sort of have the most unique targets, do you think? Yeah, Sebastian. Why do you think fungi? Okay, so fungi are their own kingdom, but so are bacteria. Okay, here, we'll, we'll, we'll step back for a second. Which one, are we, are you a prokaryote or a eukaryote? Yeah. Eukaryote, we got this. Okay, up here, prokaryote or eukaryote? Yeah. Hmm. So in fact, that's one thing. There's a pretty big difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. It's actually kind of, can be in some ways kind of hard for our, cell, for our immune cells to tell the difference between certain fungal cells and certain parasite cells because they're eukaryotic just like us. Whereas at least bacteria are prokaryotic. So they have some good targets that are a little easier to, t to distinguish. What about viruses? How do viruses fit into all this business? Yeah. Okay, we can't even decide if they're alive. So prokaryote, eukaryote, is a, you can't, can't really make a distinction there. But viruses use our cells in order to reproduce. They have to take advantage of our cells to reproduce. So they don't even have their own stuff in some cases. They use ours. So if they are using our stuff, how the heck can we defend against them without killing our stuff. So whether or not the, path, the pathogen is actually varying from our cells, is there a difference? What kind of difference? Becomes a huge thing that we have to think about. Um, and so in these ways, um, you know, pathogens are gonna be sort of important, sort of tricky to think about. We can also think, do those pathogens vary? Do they mutate quickly? If I decide I am going to look for a pathogen with this protein on its surface, is that protein likely to change? If it changes, then I'm out of luck. So there are some microbes that change often. There are some microbes that don't change very often. Viruses change super easily. Fungi don't change super easily. Um, and so that changes what kind of response we might make to them. We also think a lot about where microbes live. Some live outside of our cells. Some live inside of our cells in the cytoplasm. Some live inside of our cells in different compartments. There are some that live in the nucleus. There are some that live in um, the uh, endosomes. They're, they live in all sorts of places. If you wanted to, to, to kill them, Something you, what you would use to kill a thing outside of the cell is probably different than what you would use to kill a thing inside of the cell. Because inside of the cell, you could hurt the cell. Outside of the cell, maybe a little bit less so. Also, inside the cell, um, you kind of almost have to have like x-ray vision or something to see it. Um, and so the location where that pathogen lives is going to impact the types of immune responses that we see. And finally, um, we also have to realize that the size of pathogens matters. Viruses are pretty small. If you think back to what people think about immune responses, say your non-science friend or something like that, eventually, this is going to date me, eventually you end up with Pac-Man. Somebody talks about Pac-Man. You have these cells and they just go in and they eat all the bad guys, right? Sure, sounds good. Makes sense for a virus, makes sense for bacteria. So this is um, a type of pathogen, this is called Ascaris. Um, these are parasitic worms. These are somebody's hands holding Ascaris. This came out of someone's uh, GI tract. And that's multiple copies, multiple individuals of this worm. Look how, so I mean, each of these little stringies is an individual worm. Your immune system's not going to eat that. That's bigger than one of your cells. 
You can't have a cell eat that. <laughs> and so the types of responses are going to have to be totally different for something that's big versus something that's really small. And so all of these things are going to be things that we're going to be thinking about as we think about different types of um, microbes um, and how we defend against them. All right. So I showed you this last time. Um, this is sort of the way that we think about the immune system. And it is this big integrated system. In order to make some sense of it, we like to divide up the immune system into some categories. And so instead of looking at it like this, we like to put parts of it into some categories. Um, I will tell you that those categories are a little bit artificial. They're things that we as scientists made up. The immune system doesn't know, today I am in this category, tomorrow I am in this category. Um, and so there are places within these, these categories where like the boundaries are a little wishy-washy because we made them up. It's not like our body came up with that perfectly. But we do have these general categories. Um, and so we can divide the immune system into three general layers. And those three layers are described here. So the first layer of immune responses that we have are known as the barrier defenses. The barrier defenses are things that nobody really ever thinks about as being immune related, but they are. Um, and their big goal is to keep microbes out, or so to make a barrier so that microbes can't get in. Um, sometimes they also can be thought of as sort of knocking down numbers <laughs> a little bit, just to make it easier for some of the other parts of the immune system. Um, this gives you an example of some of the things that we think of as being barrier defenses. The largest immune organ in your body, really, is the skin, because it is serving as a barrier to keep out microbes. If you don't believe me that the skin is an important thing in the immune system, um, you should talk to some patients who are burn patients, who have issues with skin integrity. Most of the problems with burn patients is that they are getting so many infections because they don't have that barrier anymore. Um, we also have things, uh, some additional sort of chemical parts of that. Um, we've got things like the low pH in the stomach, the acid, uh, acidity of the stomach. We've got things like the cilia in the airway. And, then, and we've, in fact, got mucus, which is basically a goopy sugar layer covering our cells so that microbes can't find them. I'm, I'm not kidding you. That's really what it is. Um, we've got cilia trying to basically push things out. Um, all of these are great examples of the barrier defenses. Immunologists don't spend a ton of time thinking about and talking about barrier defenses, although we'll talk about them a little bit later in the semester. And honestly, we're all, the way the field is going right now, we're like, wait a minute. That might be important. And in some ways, you're like, yeah, duh. Um, but in fact, this has actually been an area that's relatively understudied is some of the details of what's going on at the barrier organs. Um, immunologists tend to spend much more time talking about um, the other two major layers of immunity. So those two layers are known as the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. Um, in the past, you may have heard of something called the acquired immune system or acquired immunity. Immunologists don't use that term anymore. Um, honestly, we stopped using that term around 2000. Um, but some of the people who write textbooks took immunology before that, and so they don't know that we changed. So it's like still like it's this weird thing where like some textbooks still have it, and I get angry. Dunaway originally learned it, and I kind of went off on him once when he talked about acquired immunity. So anyway, we don't use acquired immunity anymore. 
What, and if you've learned about acquired immunity, it's adaptive. We've changed the word to adaptive. Um, so, and that's really because we have realized that, that the adaptive is a better way of describing what that response does as opposed to acquired. Um, so these are kind of the two big responses that are out there. One thing I will tell you, even on this slide from your textbook showing some barrier defenses, there are some things that I personally would say are actually innate on this slide. So again, it's not a super perfect line. Um, I, I didn't verbally say some of the things on this slide because I don't usually think of them as being barrier. Um, so it's not completely perfect. You will also see that I have something called intrinsic immunity here. Um, intrinsic immunity are ways that cells them can protect themselves without needing to involve anybody else. <laughs> um, that's something that, that virologists care a lot about with viruses, and immunologists never talk about it. And so if you read a virology textbook, there's actually four bars here instead of three. I kind of say with intrinsic is barrier. Sometimes intrinsic could be immune or innate too, but whatever. So what you can see is that this is a little fuzzy. Um, but there are some things that define um, innate versus adaptive immune responses. Table from your textbook. Um, so the innate immune response is the, going to be um, allowing for a response within minutes to hours after infection. I usually think of an innate immune response as protecting you during the first 96 hours following infection. So innate immune responses are early. You might imagine that's probably pretty important given how fast microbes reproduce. Adaptive immune responses happen a bit later. Um, they usually take days. Um, so we can say that they probably really start to get pretty good at about a week. They actually max out at about two weeks um, following infection. So that's one major difference between these two. Um, another major difference is in their specificity. I'm going to say a little bit about specificity now. I am going to say a lot about specificity later. Specificity is a, one of immunologists' favorite words. <laughs> um, so the idea here with the, and part of the reason why we're going to like have to hit that back on this later is because it's going to make more sense when we talk about some other things. The idea is that the innate immune response is responding really generally to pathogens. So it might recognize all gram-positive bacteria. Doesn't matter which gram-positive bacteria it is, it's just like, that's a gram-positive bacteria. It's bad. Um, alternatively, the um, adaptive immune response is really, really specific. So the adaptive immune response is going to be able to recognize Staphylococcus aureus versus Staphylococcus epidermidis, even though they're both gram positives. In fact, the adaptive immune system is, might, is going to tell the difference between this year's flu and last year's flu. If there are differences in our immune responses to the variants like Delta, it's because of the specificity of the adaptive immune system. The innate immune system, it doesn't care. It's responding to all of them as kind of like RNA virus bad. Um, the adaptive is the one that's going to be more specific. For some reason, immunologists love the phrase, the exquisite specificity of the adaptive immune system. I don't know why, but that's the phrase that people use. Um, this is related to the way that receptors are set up in those two systems. And so as we talk about the receptors in those two systems, um, that this is that's going to come into specificity. The other um, big difference is that your innate immune response is going to be the same same every time you are infected with something. So if you get um, the flu today and then you get the flu again in a few months, you're going to make the identical innate immune response. It does not change. 
the adaptive immune response does change. So you get a better response the second time around. So you will make a better adaptive immune response. In fact, the response adapts um, in order to give you a better response the second time around. Um, and there are different kind of cells and organs that are responsible in both of these cases. Um, so just to sort of further tell you about that timing thing, um, this is just another example of this. So if you were infected with something, you would make an innate immune response, as is shown here in the lighter blue, and you'd make an adaptive response, as shown in the darker blue. You can see that the innate response is doing its thing faster and earlier than the adaptive. However, if you get infected a second time, you're going to make the identical innate response. The innate response is not going to change over time. But the adaptive response is going to change a lot. Um, and so you're going to see this very different um, type of adaptive response. Um, in the past, and this is, I'll say, within definitely 25 years, absolutely. Um, immunologist, there were a lot of immunologists who thought the innate immune system is lame. The adaptive immune system is really the cool one. Because it does this cool thing where it changes over time. And it's super cool because it's specific. It's not general. And so everybody loved the adaptive immune system. And everyone was like, innate immunity. No one cares. Um, just so you know, this is uh, one thing to think about on that view. So in the yellow line, we are looking at sort of theoretically what might happen to, with a person um, who got infected. So we're looking at the number of microbes in that person over time. And you could see that we can, you can pick your favorite microbe. Person can get infected. The microbe's going to reproduce for a while. It's going to stop and sort of get to a peak level. And then it's going to go away. And that both that stopping and that clearance are going to be based on immune responses. Um, there are patients who are born who actually have mutations, so they do not make adaptive immune systems. There are people with no adaptive immune system. And in those individuals um, who are shown in the green line, we tend to see something like what's shown here, which is that they get infected. They have microbes that come up to um, some kind of um, peak level. But they do stop exponentially growing. Um, but they never go away. They, those people sort of can't clear that infection. Um, those people have a tough life. Um, this is boy in a bubble syndrome, where you basically have to live in a plastic bubble for your whole life. This is and um, before we had treat, we have a, some treatments for it now. Um, before that, most of these kids would die before they hit ten. So it's not like this is a good thing. But I want to contrast that to the red line, which is the idea of what would happen if you were lacking innate immune responses. If you're lacking innate immune responses, what you can see is that those microbes increase exponentially, never slow down, never, not, never stop at some peak. They just go on exponentially. This is theoretical, because we have never seen a person who completely lacks an innate immune system. Our understanding is that not having an innate immune system is not compatible with being alive. So you cannot have a person without an innate immune system. Um, and so as much as immunologists were always like, oh, adaptive immunity is so cool. Um, innate immunity, no one cares. Um, innate immunity is kind of really important. <laughs> um, and it's something that we should uh, you know, make sure that we're paying a lot of attention to. Um, we are going to kind of go through the specifics of innate immunity, um, some on Friday and next week. So innate immunity starts being done then. Um, but what we need to think a little bit about now are other ways that we can divide up cells of the, uh, the immune system into categories to make sense of that complex system that I've shown you.
And one of the ways that we can do that is we can divide up the blood cells to see who we have as members of this immune system. Um, there are a bunch of different types of blood cells. I'm going to show you this list a couple of times, and we're going to talk through some of the specifics of them. Um, our lab tomorrow also um, is going to be about looking at these under microscope. And so you will be much more comfortable with many of these cell types by the end of lab tomorrow. Um, and so first of all, if we think about uh, cells of the blood, we've got the red blood cells, um, which are technically known as erythrocytes. Um, we've got platelets. Um, platelets actually come from a type of cell called a megakaryocyte. So I kind of put those two things together. And then we have the cells that immunologists really think about, the ones we th spend most of our time on, which are the white blood cells. And the white blood cells are also known as the leukocytes. Um, so leukocyte is a general term for all white blood cells. There are specific types of leukocytes. So leukocyte means all these guys. <laughs> Some of these other terms mean some of the specific types of leukocytes. So within the leukocytes, there are three major types, the granulocytes, the monocytes, and the lymphocytes. Um, students always want to, to try to flip lymphocytes and leukocytes. So notice lymphocytes, the big picture name. Leukocytes are one of the smaller groups under lymphocytes. So we've got the three types of granulocytes, we've got the monocytes, and we've got the lymphocytes. Um, We'll get more into the specifics of them in a second. Um, your textbook also shows, um, maybe, come on. Your textbook also shows um, some of the things that differ between these cell types. And so this is the uh, table from chapter two about some of these cell types. I'm going to zoom in on some different parts of this table. This is the whole table. For example, these cells vary a lot in terms of how long they live. So you can see that there are some that live for a small number of days. You can see that there are some that are really there for hours to days. You can also see that there are some that are there for years. So that's going to be one of the big distinguishing factors is how long those cells live. You can also see that there are big differences in terms of how many of these cells you have in the blood. So for example, the red blood cells in a, basically in a, a, about a milliliter of blood, you have 5 million red blood cells, 5 times 10 to the 6. But with some of these, you have only, um, of your leukocytes, you have far fewer um, of them. So, you know, you can see, for example, with the neutrophils, you have about 3,000 in that same milliliter instead of a million. Um, there are some that are even more rare. You have less than perhaps 100. Um, and these types, cell types vary a lot in sort of their percentages because that's how math works um, if the numbers vary that way too. Um, and so, again, here you can see kind of all of that of that variation that I've just shown you. All of these cells come from the same original stem cell. So all of these cells, whether they are the granulocytes, whether they are the monocytes, whether they're the lymphocytes, whether they're the red blood cells, whether they're the platelets, all develop from the same original stem cells in your body which are known as the hematopoietic stem cells, or HSCs. The process of this development is called hematopoiesis. Um, this has two Greek roots. Hema, which you might have heard of before. What's hema mean? Or heme, yeah. Blood. So we got blood. Poesis is the one nobody knows, but actually you do. You just don't know you know it. 
Poesis actually is the same Greek root as is, as is in the word poetry. And it means to make. So hematopoiesis, to make blood. Um, immunologists love to put poesis on things. So if you're going to make lymphocytes, it's lymphopoiesis. If you're going to make red blood cells, it's erythropoiesis. You can make whatever and call it whatever poesis. And people love to write things about the poetry of blood cells when they write about this. And I'm always like, OK, I've heard that joke like 7,000 times. We're, we're, we're good now. But um, so all of these cells are coming from the same original stem cell. That's what's in your bone marrow. Your bone marrow uh, contains the hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and so right now, your bone marrow has lots of these stem cells. And in fact, you are currently doing hematopoiesis. So there are lots of times throughout this semester where I will point out different processes um, that are happening at all times in an individual. Uh, and I usually say, as I will say here with hematopoiesis, next time your mom yells at you and says you're being lazy and not doing anything, you can be like, oh, mom, I'm doing hematopoiesis. Mom. Um, <laughs> You can tell my mom is super lucky to have two immunologist daughters. Um, so um, we can, one thing that's sort of useful here is that the hematopoiesis process matches up pretty nicely with some of the other ways that we divide up blood cells. So it turns out that these cells here in the middle are all the granulocytes, one of those groups I told you about before. So the granulocytes kind of had their own developmental pathway. These cells are the monocytes. The monocytes have their own developmental pathway. These cells are the lymphocytes. The lymphocytes have their own developmental pathway. So it's not just that we came up with this sort of random classification system. It does map onto kind of the processes of development of these cells somewhat. Um, so if we look back at our types of cells, um, the first type we're going to talk about are the granulocytes. There are three types of granulocytes. And the granulocytes, if we were to add them all up, are the ones that are most frequent out of all the white blood cells. So yeah, the red blood cells are the most frequent. If we go just in the white blood cells, granulocytes are number one. The three, granu the three major granulocyte types are shown here. Granulocytes got their name because they have granules. And when you look at them under the microscope, they have all these little dots, which are all granules. Basically, they're all little packets of things the cell wants to secrete. So the, these cells all have a whole lot of granules. That's how they got the name, granulocyte. Um, the three types of granulocytes are neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. Um, one other piece about granulocytes is that in general, um, if you look at them under a microscope, they have a super weird nucleus. Um, this neutrophil is a good example. The purple is the nucleus. So it's like it's the nucleus has five pieces <laughs> here. They have these weird lobed nuclei also. We have absolutely no idea why that is. But granulocytes have wacky nuclei, and they have granules. Um, the, they were originally divided up um, based on whether or not they bound to certain dyes, specifically whether they bound to an acid or a base. The basic one was the basophil, loves base. <laughs> uh, the other one bound to a dye called eosin, so it was an eosinophil, loves eosin. The other one was neutral, <laughs> Didn't ha wasn't acid or base. So it was a neutrophil. Um, so that was the naming of these. Again, we are actually going to be looking at these un under the microscope in class tomorrow, um, or in lab tomorrow. If we look at um, the cells of the blood, neutrophils, you will notice, are the most common white blood cells. 
So of your white blood cells, between 50 and 70% of your white blood cells are neutrophils. So most of your white blood cells are neutrophils. We also can think about the eosinophils and the basophils. And what you should notice about the eosinophils and the basophils is that they are present at much lower numbers. So you can see the uh, eosinophils are present at between 1% to 3% of the white blood cells. The basophils are at less than 1% of the white blood cells. Um, we know way less about eosinophils and basophils, especially basophils. We know very little about basophils because we can't get them because they're so rare. Um, in fact, you are going to be looking at blood under a microscope tomorrow. You may not see eosinophils. We'll probably find eosinophils. You may, we may not see a basophil tomorrow. That's OK, because, well, I'm happy that the donor got to keep their one basophil. Because um, they're just so rare, they are often very hard to find. Um, neutrophils, in fact, are something that um, we see a lot of um, in terms of a lot of different immune responses. So neutrophils, in fact, um, you are making them constantly. You store a whole lot of them in your bone marrow. And if you need them, you just release them. They're kind of like the SWAT team in a lot of ways. Um, if you go to the doctor's office and you have um, blood work done, very frequently you have something called a complete blood count done, where what they do is they see how many neutrophils do you have in your blood, how many lymphocytes. They specifically are just checking percentages of these guys. And sometimes you'll say, oh, you have too many white cells. You have an elevated number of white cells. What that means is you just dumped a bunch of neutrophils into your blood. That you just, all the neutrophils got released. And that probably means you're sick, because you released them. That, that, that is, you just now have learned about how to diagnose somebody with a complete blood count, or at least one of the ways. If you have too many white cells, it's probably because you put neutrophils in the blood, and that probably means you're sick. Very specific. Um, so uh, neutrophils are one that do, in fact, come up a lot. Um, if you lo ever look at your blood results, um, you can actually look at your percentages, and the neutrophil percentage is something that um, people will be looking at. There is one other type of cell that is related to granulocytes. Um, this is a cell that you are not going to see tomorrow when we look in the blood. Um, it's, and it's a, but it is officially it is a granulocyte. The reason why you're not going to see it tomorrow is because these cells actually don't really live most of their time in the blood. They go and live in other tissues. So if, you look, if I were to look in your lungs, you, we'd find a lot of them. If I were to look in your skin, I'd find a lot of them. They just don't hang out in the blood very often. These cells are known as mast cells. You can see in both of these electron microscopy images, oh, do they have granules. You can see lots and lots and lots of granules in those mast cells. And mast cells, in fact, pretty much all they do is they release those granules um, when they are triggered. Um, those granules contain a whole lot of substances. The most famous of those substances is called histamine. Mast cells are the reason I have allergies. They lead to a lot of major allergic reactions is when the mast cells get triggered and they shouldn't be. Um, they are related to granulocytes. In fact, that there is a, there's a lot of increasing evidence that, in fact, they may be like grown-up basophils. Um, but since we can't really find basophils very often, it's hard to test that. Um, but we think they're related to basophils. Um, the, another major type of cell that we have are the monocytes. Um, so monocytes are uh, important cells that, are, um, that we can see. They also can kind of develop into a few types, um, one of which is known as a macrophage. For the majority of this semester, I'm going to use the words monocyte and macrophage interchangeably, although technically they are not the same thing. I'm just going to call them the same thing now. Um, 
really, the monocyte is the version that's in the blood, and the macrophage is what it's called when it goes live, to live somewhere else, when it grows up and lives somewhere else. Um, these are, um, so these are also really important cells of uh, the immune response. You may very well have heard about monocytes and macrophages before and not known it. Um, because it turns out that once upon a time, um, when people were doing kind of anatomy and histology and looking at different parts of the body under a microscope, they saw weird kinds of cells and they gave them names. And nobody realized they were all actually the same cell in the different anatomic locations. And so macrophages in different parts of your body have fancy names. But as far as immunologists care, they're all macrophages. <laughs> um, so for example, if you've heard of microglia in a uh, neuroscience class, microglia are macrophages that live in the brain. Um, if you have heard of um, Kupfer cells in the liver, Kupfer cells are macrophages that live in the liver. If you've heard of Langerhans cells in the skin, Langerhans cells are macrophages that live in the skin, um, and on and on. So um, all of these, as far as we are going to care, are just macrophages, <laughs> um, even if they, somebody once in the past gave them a fancy name. Um, In addition, there's one other type of cell that is related to the um, monocyte and the macrophage, and that cell is called a dendritic cell. Again, these guys don't hang out in the blood. They only really hang out in tissues. Um, they were called dendritic because they had these big, long projections. They looked kind of like what you saw in neurons with dendrites, so they got called dendritic. They have nothing to do with neurons. Um, but they have these big, long, stretchy things. This is one example of what a dendritic cell looks like. You can see all of these long projections coming off of that dendritic cell. If these guys were in the blood, moving at the speed the blood moves, all those things would get ripped off. So these guys don't live in the blood. They only live in the tissue. But they are, in fact, sort of one of the options when a monocyte grows up. Um, the uh, monocytes you can see are kind of in the middle um, in terms of their frequency. Um, so they are less frequent than the neutrophils. They are more frequent than the limb. Or sorry, they're, they're, you know, they're in the middle. <laughs> I was going to phrase that in a weird way. They're in the middle. Um, so I also want to sort of give you one other piece of info here. So right now, basically all of the cells that we've talked about all kind of are related to one another developmentally from that stem cell. So here you can see all of the granulocytes, and then you can see the monocyte also developing over here, um, potentially to the macrophage or the dendritic cell. So you can see kind of there's this little track where a cell can become one of these two cell types. And we can distinguish that from the lymphocytes. The other thing that we can do is when we think about these distinctions, they also match up with one of the distinctions I told you about earlier, which is that granulocytes and monocytes make up the innate immune system, while lymphocytes make up the adaptive immune system. And so that's another reason why these are sort of important distinctions is because they will come together with those distinctions that we talked about before. Um, on uh, Friday, I'm going to talk more about cells and organs of the immune system and potentially get into innate immunity. That might not happen until Monday because somehow I'm desperately behind. Welcome to life. Um, so uh, I will see you guys tomorrow in class, however, where we will be uh, thinking more about these cell types. So I will see you guys then. <laughs>